All right, so welcome everyone. Today we are reviewing the work done in sprints 46 and 47. As you can see, our team slide continues to grow. And in fact, we have two team slides now. Um, part of this is that um, teams are being restructured a little bit, but we also have some new teams as well. Um, so you can see we've got um, a new team, this third one down called Stripes Force. Um, and this is a team made up of folks um, doing UX and accessibility. There's some front side folks on it, some core team folks on it. Um, I think there's a slide later on that gives the specifics of who's on the team. Um, we have also just sort of scanning down the list, we've broken out um, the ERM team. Really, there's really two parts um, to the ERM project and two teams. There's the KINT team who's focusing on licenses and agreements and so on. And then there's the Leipzig team that's um, working on the usage data. Um, we have um, Lehi on now um, as well. I'm not sure if we've had Lehi on the slides before, but um, this is um, a team um, led by Michelle Cernovsky, who's working on um, protocol, or sorry, NSIP, protocol for service requests and fulfillment. We've also added um, the data platform team. This is um, Naseeb's um, team uh, that is working on the reporting SIGs reference implementation. And then we have um, three new teams, um, entirely new to the project, um, Spitfire, Thunderjet, and Vega. Um, and you can see Spitfire is working on e-holding app, Thunderjet on OAI, PMH, and acquisitions, and Vega is picking up from FoleyJet um, on local password management. So a lot of new people. Um, welcome to all the new teams. Um, you can see the details of who's, who's working where. Um, on these slides, and I'm just gonna kind of scan through and see if there are any notable changes here, aside from, of course, the addition of new teams. Uh, yeah, um, oh, looks like, oh, um, this is a change. So Mark Deutsch, who was on the core team, is now working on um, the Kint um, ERM team. And Roman is um, working with Naseeb on the data platform team. And then here you can see all of the new um, team members on Spitfire, um, which is um, Kalila is the PO, um, Thunderjet. Um, we've got a, a number of different POs working with Thunderjet on different things, and Vega, which is um, Kalila as the PO. So very exciting project continues to grow. Also exciting is the Q3 release. So we've, we've released Q3, it went out yesterday. Um, so you can see the release notes up on the wiki. There's a link in the deck. And um, in addition to releasing 27 functional features, there are a bunch of NFRs in there as well, um, across 13 different epics. We also learned a lot about the release process. Um, this was our first time really trying to get structured with the release. And I think we had a lot of good lessons learned that will ap apply to the Q4 release. So I just want to say a huge thanks to all the developers and DevOps and testers and POs and UX designers and subject matter experts, everyone who contributed to this. Um, thank you for all your hard work. So now we're on to Q4. And um, the release period, the development period for Q4 did begin yesterday. And um, it is currently targeted to release on January 14th. Um, the focus um, per direction from the product council is on delivering features needed by our first early implementer to go live. Um, that's Chalmers. Um, this is because Chalmers Go Live needs really were like a subset of what was needed by the other early implementers. So we did a, a gap analysis to find out, you know, what all the early implementers needed um, in terms of features and Chalmers was just a perfect subset. And so um, our direction was really to focus on, on getting them going and then we'll turn to the remaining features after that. Um, so we are still working on nailing down our baseline um, targeted features for Q4. Um, we, the POs have indicated in JIRA um, which features they want to see in Q4. 
Um, but we still need to do a bit of refinement to kind of make sure that what we've got in there is feasible. You can see the, the, the working list right now by clicking on these links in the deck. Talked about this last time, definition of done. Um, I think I'll just scan over this. I mean, really the highlight is that um, we are in general only um, showing work that has passed uh, test. Um, you can see the highlights of what people have been working on by um, team in the deck here. And much of this we will be covering in the demos. So I'm just going to skip over the details. which takes us straight into the demos. All right, um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Igor from FollyJet, um, which is the first team to present. I'll stop sharing, Igor, so you can go ahead. Yes, hello, hello, FollyJet is here. <laughs> uh, give me just a few seconds, I'm gonna share my screen. And how it's going on? Is it clear? Yes. 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 Looks good. So uh, let's get started. Uh, let me first of all uh, log in into the system. And go to the user password change page and uh, here we are. So for the last time, uh, Foligit team prepared a full scale uh, functionality about uh, password validation that happens on password change page. And uh, the first thing, the first interesting thing I would say uh, was applied here is a password strength meter. Uh, I'm gonna input something and password strength meter appears. So uh, this component, this is this is a smart component for reuse uh, and it's applied for the new password we are going to enter uh, into this field. And uh, as we see, it has a different levels of strengths. Uh, and each level has its own uh, list of uh, rules of, I would say, constraints. Uh, and also it helps us to understand how uh, we can improve our new password and make it more uh, resistant and strong because we have a separate special label uh, that marks us something like uh, please uh, type more digits or make your password uh, longer. On the first level, it uh, uh, looks like different. Yes, it's talking about uh, make your password more random. So this is, this is our first deliverable uh, on this page. And uh, just in general, this new uh, component uh, works like an information panel. It doesn't block us to change password, uh, even if uh, the password is not strong, even if password is weak. And anyway, we can, we can, we can uh, submit the new password, even if the strength level is red, is a red light, yes. Uh, let's go ahead with our new feature. Uh, and this is this is an old password validation. Uh, I would say this is a current password validation because uh, because uh, before password became validation, uh, the system has to make sure the person who is gonna change uh, his password uh, knows. Uh, his current password, and this is a part of UI validation. So let's take a look how, how it's going on. 
I will show I will show all of the passwords on this page and try to type something is not related to our current password. Uh, then we will try we will try to uh, change it on new password. and submit it. So the new message appeared. We have, we prepared a separate message for this case. And it's talking about incorrect password. Please retype your password again, because it's not, uh, uh, it doesn't equal to the password, uh, which is current for the user. Uh, the next one, large uh, feature we prepared is, uh, uh, I would say, advanced backend password validation. Uh, so backend password validation implies applying a list of uh, so-called validation rules to receive a uh, new password in backend part of the application. Uh, and uh, every validation rule has a metadata helps to understand how the new password should be checked. And currently we have two kinds of rules. The first one is uh, regular expression rules and the next one type is programmatic rules. Uh, so uh, in our case, regular expression rules uh, can validate password on condition can be uh, written in regular statement. For example, it's, it's better applied to, uh, to check, for example, is password contain at least uh, one uh, special character or password uh, has a minimum eight characters, something like that. And uh, what about programmatic rules? Programmatic rules validation uh, comes more complex. And uh, the, the, the best uh, way, for example, uh, for this rule is, uh, I would say, uh, for example, if we need to uh, check receive password, if it's not in a bad password list, uh, and all of the password bad password list, we can we can retrieve from somewhere in the system. It may be it may be even third party system. Uh, and all of the all of the rules are stored in tenant configuration level, uh, and the. In future releases, uh, we'll support the ability for tenant to make updates uh, using user interface uh, and update uh, tenant configuration. So it's it's so complex. It's a, it's a, it's so it's so flexible uh, because we can add something new, change something new, and something like that. Uh, let's let's try to. Uh, Play, I would say with those rules, with those regex and those programmatic rules to understand uh, more tightly. Uh, well, first of all, let me let me uh, push the password, the current user's password, and uh, let's try to change it on something uh, more weak. Let's try to submit it. And as a result, we have a list of uh, validation error messages. All the error messages, uh, all, of the, all of those items are uh, related to the rule uh, that was validate uh, our received password. So uh, we can, we can uh, disable uh, one of those rules and uh, try to validate the password again. Uh, so it's so it's so flexible and it's not so complex. Uh, in our case, we see that password must contain both lowercase and uppercase level uh, letters. Let's try to modify it uh, to satisfy this rule. Uh, something like that. And let's. Let's submit it again. Yes, we have already satisfied the first rule and let's try to go to satisfy the next one. 
The next one is talking about password must contain at least one numeric character. Uh, let's try to type at least one numeric character here. Oh. <clears throat> and submit it again. Yes, and the last rule is talking about uh, we need to type for at least one special character here. Yes, seems like we are fine. And the uh, notification message has been appeared in the bottom of the page. And it's talking about the password has been successfully changed. Uh, let's try to uh, log out follow user from the system and log in again under the new changed password. This is a super user. Well, honestly, I don't remember the password we submitted before. <laughs> <laughs> Give me just a few seconds. I'm gonna I'm gonna recall it. Yes. Was there other um, functionality you were gonna show us as well besides just logging back in? Because if this is your last thing, then maybe we just move on. Yes, I would say this is, this is, this is uh, the, last, the last thing about uh, the backend validation, but uh, I, I just wanted to add that uh, the full uh, scale of the backend validation is too large. So, uh, the backend validation engine is uh, able to register uh, different kinds of the rules and we can uh, we can reuse all of these rules and it's not so complex it's easy and uh, yes and this is from my side okay well, thank you great. very much yes thank you very much for your attention Great. Any questions for Folly Jet? All right. That looks really good. Okay. Um, Igor, if you could um, quit sharing, then we can hand over to the next presenter. Um, it looks like Stax is up next with the demo being led by EBSCO FSE. And I'll just mention Khalil is out. Khalil is the product owner for the passwords. Um, but uh, really appreciate all the work that Folajet's done. And the remainder of the password work is moving over to the new team, Vega, uh, along with Kalila. So it's really good to see this all come into life. Looks really nice. OK. All right. So who's doing the demo for stacks? So I believe we're going to get some help from Craig McNally here. If he's... Oh, yeah. Craig, are you ready? Uh, yeah, I was. I, I, would, I had prepared a demonstration of the Gobi integration. I'm not sure if that's what Dennis was referring to. Yes, that's what we're... Okay, so um, hang on, I guess, I guess I can jump into that. Um, or we can just wait until we get to that uh, in the EBSCO presentation. Whatever you prefer. Well, let's just do that because I have a slide that needs to be presented as well. Okay. 
All right, sounds good. Um, well, that's actually next in my list <laughs> is EBSCO. <laughs> um, all right, so do you want me to pull up the slide deck? Or do you want to present? Why don't you present, Craig? Oh, okay. If you've got it handy, I, I can pull it up if you'd prefer. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay, um, so I think we're going a little bit out of order. I think uh, Hung Wei and Tanuj were gonna go first, but that's okay. I'll just jump into this. Um, what I'm presenting today is a Gobi integration. Um, so um, first and foremost, I wanna point out that what I'm demoing isn't um, part of Folio uh, testing or snapshot stable. Um, we'll be demoing this from the uh, EBSCO FSE integration environment. Um, the main reason there is that the QA uh, Gobi account is, that's where that's pointing, is our integration environment. Um, there are also several parts to this that aren't integrated with the Vagrant Box and Folio testing and Snapshot Stable. Um, that effort is underway, um, so hopefully they'll happen sooner than later. Um, and so what I'm gonna be demonstrating is, uh, you can, as you can see on the slide, placing an order in Gobi. Um, the order is, is uh, is sent to edge orders and you specify type Gobi and an API key is also sent along as well. Um, edge orders uh, logs into Folio as an institutional user and then proxies a request to Mod Gobi. Mod Gobi uh, does some mapping of the XML request to JSON that's, that uh, Folio understands um, and then also augments that request with uh, lookups of, of the vendor, the location, material types, a couple other things. Uh, finally, uh, a call is made to Mod Orders to place the order. Um, mod Orders makes several calls to Mod Order Storage to create the PO, the PO lines, and all the related objects. So cost details, uh, vendor details, all that stuff. Um, once that's created, a response is returned. Uh, Gobi forms an XML response that Gobi understands, including the PO line number, and returns that to Gobi. Um, you can see several things here grayed out. Um, that's work that's either in progress or uh, has yet to be started. Um, the number three here where mod Gobi calls mod configuration to get tenant specific field mappings. Um, that work is underway and hopefully we can demonstrate that in the next print review. Um, number seven is to interact with mod finance to uh, apply funds, funds codes, encumbrances, all that stuff. Um, and number eight is to interact with mod order storage to um, essentially manage the instance holding and item records associated with the order. So let me jump over to uh, Gobi. And so here's Gobi and let me just do a quick search for a book and that does not look right. <laughs> Hang on one second. Okay, that looks better. Uh, and so let's um, place an order. I'm choosing one of the sub accounts. This sub account is for uh, print orders. Uh, we would just select a fund, uh, select a location, add some optional notes to Gobi, material type, select this from the list book. Uh, again, optional uh, receiving notes, requester, and then uh, optional tags, and this is a multi-select. Um, all that looks good, so I'll place the order. And so right now it's actually sending the request to Folio uh, and, and doing all that work. So it came back, uh, you can see that the order has been acknowledged. And if we open this up, we can see the details of the order itself. So the important part to note here is the PO number, this A219, et cetera, ending in 339-1. Um, if we open this, we can get a little bit more of the details, some of the notes and optional fields. Um, so if I head over to Folio and I go to the orders app, uh, you'll see here's our order. A29, yada, 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 399, or 339. And when I click on that, you can see the PO number is ending in 339-1, and that aligns with what we saw here. 
And so you'll notice that a lot of the information here is missing. Um, and so that's work that is to be done as well. Um, <clears throat> you can see some of it is there. Um, so the main, the main, oh, sorry, go ahead, Dennis. Sorry, it sounded like uh, Dennis was trying to say something. Uh, so it's a lot of this information is actually persisted in the database right now. Um, the, it, it's just the work uh, on the UI and needs to happen to uh, populate these fields. And one of the blockers there is that um, for the mod orders business logic module, we're not, uh, we haven't implemented the get endpoints yet to actually get an entire purchase order and all the details associated with it. Um, so right now the UI is still calling directly to mod order storage. And so um, in order to uh, cut down on technical debt, we're gonna stop doing that and wait for mod orders uh, business logic module to be implemented, uh, which should be sh soon. Um, and so um, this work obviously touches a lot of different pieces as you saw in that initial slide. Um, it's been a collaborative effort between uh, the Stacks folks, EBSCO, um, Martin Tran, um, Matt Reno and myself, as well as some um, work from other teams at EBSCO on the Gobi uh, side for setting up configs um, and administrative accounts and, and testing all that stuff. Um, so big thanks to everyone. That's it. That looks great, Craig. Thanks for sharing. So who should go next from EBSCO? I'm sorry, I messed up the order. Uh, I think it should be Hung Wei and Tanuja. Uh, Tanuja, can you share the screen, please? And while y'all are sharing, major celebrations on the Gobi side and on the Stacks and EBSCO side when, when this all worked for the first time, what, what Craig just demonstrated. So real-time integration um, that, that we're really glad to see coming to life. Hooray! <laughs> um, and Marie, also um, that integration other than some mapping work, um, it, it really works for other existing vendors as well, correct? Yes, so uh, as long as they'll use the, the format of message that, uh, that Gobi is using, then it should be easy for Folio to interpret the message. Um, ideally, we want to build a UI at some point on the Folio side that will allow the users to map the the data that's coming in to specific fields in the order record for some of the some of the um, the the data that could go into various fields, and also to set defaults for some of the uh, data elements in the order record and order line record that are not being sent in the in the message. So uh, that's uh, yet to be done, but that's a piece that that we want to add to make it better. Waiting for the go ahead. You're all clear. Thank you. Okay, uh, last time we, uh, this is Hong Wei and Tunita from Ibisco. So last time we demoed the data capture POC work. Uh, it was a simple module uh, based on a simple Bootex start project. It basically implements a copy pre and post filter capture uh, all the traffic data and send the data to an uh, external Kafka queue or maybe Rapid MQ. So since then, uh, we formalized the work by splitting it to two backend modules. As you can see on this slide, uh, you have a mod audit filter module that implements the filter. And we have another module called mod audit uh, that is uh, RMB compliant, uh, RMB uh, 1.0 module. Uh, it provided the crawl API and stored the audit data to the PostgreSQL. So basically, audit the data, audit filter module, capture the data, and then send it to the mod audit module and store the data in the PostgreSQL. We also only capture those changes to the follow system by looking at the HTTP request method. If it's get, we ignore that. But we're only capturing post, you know, put, delete those kind of requests. 
Um, also, now we have a UI modules. Uh, and thanks for Tunisia. Uh, she created this UI module, talk to the mod audit. So you can actually see the data from UI. Uh, next, she will uh, demo the UI module. Oh, by the way, all the backend modules are in the daily, daily uh, folio testing Vigorant box. So if you download the Vigorant box, then you can try out by yourself. Okay, Tunisia, your turn. Tunisia, are you muted? She's having some technical difficulties. She's trying to figure it out with her headset. Got it. Um, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, can you guys see my screen as well? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, right now this is still work in progress. So um, I'm demoing it from my local host. Um, this is the UI audit. <clears throat> it's connected to the mod audit and mod audit filter, uh, Vagrant uh, Dockers. And then uh, at the initial search, it would sort by the timestamp and we would get the recent logs from the uh, mod audit. Um, and we, we can, as we can see, we can see the, the logins. Um, and if we look at the individual record, we can actually see the payload that's coming back from the mod audit with all the details of uh, the, mo the modules that have been um, logged from OCopy or the data that has been captured. Um, there is also a way to uh, search with the target IDs or uh, the target types. Uh, the target IDs being the user or uh, user ID or the login ID based on the, uh, the module that it was triggering to. <clears throat> so we can see the searches and we can also see um, the error logs as well. <coughs> And we can see the errors that that were logged during the data capture. Um, and we can also fil filter based on post, uh, post, put, delete, and patch as well. So, and also we can filter based on the timestamp. Two thousand eighteen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we can see the results coming back. And we can see the individual records for each of these. Um, that's all I have. This is cool. So is this going to allow us? to eventually you know view who changed you know if you were interested in a change on a given field um yeah. will you be able to get that data from here as well yes we should be able to see that too that's really cool okay and does it just show the the new value or does it show what it was before or? I'm just kind of curious what sort of audit data we'll be able to get out. So, okay, this is um, this is capturing essentially transactional data it uh -huh. on the um, on the response, essentially, okay. and by doing that, you create an audit trail. So you'll see that you know that what Tanuj has put together here is very uh, very uh, basic in terms of presentation and so forth. So we're not. You know, the focus of this work was not to necessarily provide the, the tools that are going to be needed with the user interfaces that, that you drill into a particular set of activities and so forth, but just to demonstrate the ability to capture and report in some fashion using the interfaces that are available to produce this kind of an output. So mm -hmm. what this means is an opportunity now for other teams and other SIGs to sort of figure out exactly the kind of reporting they want and design a UI around it. Uh, exactly the scenario as you mentioned a minute ago. 
Cool. Okay. Great. Thanks, Tanuja. Any other questions for Tanuja? Okay. It looks like then Carol and Soba are up next. Sure. Um, okay. Okay. So can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to be showing some work we've done since last demo for um, enhancing eHoldings knowledge base configuration. So in particular, I'm going to go to the settings page here. Um, so what we've done is we've updated the UI Holdings backend um, so that we use the same location now that is used for knowledge base configuration as been has been used by Mod Codex EKB. So prior to this, um, KB EBSCO was using a config setting for the username and password and an environment variable for the knowledge base URL. So now this is all stored in configuration. Um, the second thing that we did is we updated the eHoldings UI and we've added the capability to specify the endpoint, whether it be production or sandbox. Um, so this um, config supports um, entering it in UI eHoldings and it'll update the configuration for both Codex and ModKB. So um, yeah, eHoldings. Um, and that's it for this demo. Um, I think Great. next up is Soba. Yep, I'm here. <clears throat> Let sharing. me share my screen. Um, what screen are you guys seeing? Okay, I think you're seeing my wrong screen. Um, can you see the holdings app now? Yep, yep. providers. Okay. Okay, yeah. cool. So um, what I'm going to demo today is the ability for users to be able to set tokens at the package level. So earlier we implemented that at the provider level and a token is an additional piece of access that's given by a provider to be able to access their content. So if we go to packages and search for InfoTrack custom. This happens to be one package where tokens can be set both at the package level as well as at the provider level. So I chose that. Um, if we go here, we can see that there is a provider token that is set and there is no package token that has been set. So users can go, they can edit, and what they'll be able to see is the ability to update or remove or set a provider token as well as a package token since this does not exist. They can go click here and they get some help text or site ID and they can enter a value for their token. Let's say package token, for example, and save. And it shows a toast that the package has been successfully saved and we should be able to see the site ID as well as the updated value here. Um, similarly, they can update the provider token too from the same page. Um, let's just add a string and this should update it both at the package level as well as at the provider level. So if we go to provider and see the updated token, it's in sync. Um, that's all I have for tokens at the package level. And I guess that's all we have from EBSCO. Great, that looks, that looks awesome. Thanks, Soba. Thank you. Now we have to figure out how to share, stop sharing. <laughs> okay, I did that. All right, awesome. Okay, um, next up is Jeffrey from the Stripes Force team. Hey. hey. All right, I will share my screen. Um, is the, oh, there's the button. That's what I want. Okay, cool. Uh, so we should be seeing, uh, Jenkins now. Are you saying that? Yep. Yes. Okay, cool. All right. So I want to start off with a couple of technical notes before I talk about, um, kind of the, a lot of the UI stuff we've been working on. Um, so this team is kind of tasked with 
um, platform level things um, on the front end. Um, so we're working a lot on accessibility. We're working a lot on testing, um, particularly automated tests on the front end. Or we're working on some build process tooling. Um, so a, a major milestone that we hit this past sprint is, is that we now have um, actual uh, tests running for Stripe's core in the browser. Um, so um, anytime anyone opens a pull request to Stripe's core, um, we now run a login test and some navigation tests in the browser to make sure that this works in Chrome, this works in Firefox. Um, we also have some other tests running on the side that validate that this actually does work in Safari and Edge as well, uh, which is awesome. Um, and, and so um, coming up soon, we're also going to be having these tests for Stripe's smart components. Um, and we've already had these running for a while on Stripe's components. Uh, so that kind of wraps up the, that little technical note. Um, one really big win that we got out of this uh, that developers are going to love when they're working in Stripe's core any stripes, um, any front end, is that hot reload is now turned on. Um, so when you're working on a dev server um, and you're making changes to front end code, um, it will immediately update in the browser instead of having to manually hit refresh. Um, so that's a really big tooling win um, that we got out of this work. So moving over to some uh, UI work that we've been doing. Um, you've seen so in some uh, environments that the header um, in Folio can get really cluttered. Um, we have a lot of apps now, um, which is awesome. Um, but they weren't all fitting in the, the setup that we had. Um, and so uh, Rasmus did a lot of work to create this apps dropdown. Um, so what you'll see here is, is every app that you have installed on this environment is just key holdings. Um, but every app that you have installed will appear in this dropdown. Um, and then you'll see a a certain number of apps here based on what fits on the screen. Um, so if I go down to a small size, I'm only going to see the current app that I'm on, and I'm just going to have this drop down. Um, at larger sizes, more will show up as fit. Um, so I believe the maximum that will show right now is five. That's kind of arbitrary. Um, as we go along, we'll be adding more customization to that. So let's say you're at a circulation desk, and you always want check-in and check-out to be there. Um, we're going to provide some tooling around how to make that happen. Um, but that's, that's kind of further down the road. Another big uh, win that uh, has been a big feature request is, hey, if I'm on an app like eHoldings or users or inventory, how do I get back to the root of that app? Um, and so now clicking on this will bring you back to the root of the app you're on um, uh, to clear your filters or just get back to the base of where you were. Um, so that's a a pretty big win in terms of usability um, that we were uh, hearing from a lot of usability tests um, that that was coming up. Um, some other things that we've been working on are font sizes. Um, you'll see, um, you've probably noticed over the past week, lots of things getting a little bigger, some things getting a little smaller. Um, and what we've kind of settled out in is um, now uh, inputs are usually going to be larger. This window around. There we go. So inputs like this are now going to be uh, slightly larger than they were before. Labels will be slightly smaller. And the reason for that is when you're on a touch device, um, we're trying to prevent zooming. Um, so before, the font size of these were such that if you clicked on them and you tried to type something in here, it would zoom in on the input, uh, breaking your layout. Um, and so that um, will be improved by this uh, slightly different font stack. Um, We've also been making improvements to headlines um, so that um, they have the appropriate hierarchy. Um, we have a lot more headline sizes available than we used to. Um, some other kind of platform level things we've been working on are um, now the, uh, we took out a couple helper apps. Uh, you'll notice notifications has gone from the header. Um, we'll come back to that sometime in the future. Um, other things that we're shipping pretty soon that are all kind of like polished tasks are to roll out um, these large headlines across the board um, to all apps that have that concept. Um, requests might not, um, but inventory and users definitely do. Um, we're going to be moving this expand all, collapse all, and do pane header dropdowns. Um, we're going to be having edit links in there, delete links in there, um, kind of taking more use of, of that, of this kind of UI concept that we have. Um, and I believe we also have a version of this that has icons in it as well. Um, so that's all coming pretty soon. That's what we've been working on. 
I will stop sharing my screen. Nice, Jeffrey. Those are great changes, big impact. Um, okay, all right, next up is um, Istvan from Kulto. Hi, guys. So <clears throat> in the Q3 release, we released the first version of, of the opening out module, which uh, is now able to handle the regular opening hours. So we can uh, add modify the uh, uh, opening hours in the settings menu. Uh, we can uh, define opening hours per service point. Okay. Perhaps the testing is not. Uh, I yeah, had a problem with testing as well. Feel free. Okay. So we can add new service, uh, add new uh, regular opening hour for a service point. Uh, uh, we have some validations as well, so some fields should be filled. Uh, we have a kind of Google style calendar here where we can uh, define the openings for every day by uh, dragging it. Yes. Uh, service point is open all day, then we just click on the, on the first row of the calendar and uh, we can save it. And now uh, the new, new period appeared here. We can also modify it by deleting some some openings here. And of course, we are able to do the whole period. It disappears. Uh, the other thing which was released in the last release is an API from the calendar, which provides uh, Opening our information for the for the loans, we have some uh, query parameters, and uh, uh, we we can give information about the opening hours of a service point, uh, which helps to calculate, for example, the due dates in, in a JSON format. So that's all from. Kulto, we are working on the exceptional periods now, so the next release will include the exceptional opening hours as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, Isvan. Does anyone have questions? Um, okay. If not, then we will move over to the core team, um, and we've got Aditya up first. Thanks, Kate. Um, sharing my screen. Yep. Um, yeah. So I just have a couple of minor stories to show. Um, the first one is in the inventory app. Uh, when you go and view the item. Uh, we've added a bunch of accordions to this page. Uh, for example, the enumeration data, notes, item data, etc. And the story deals with like the retention of our adding the collapse all and expand all uh, functionality for the accordions. But the default is all the accordions are expanded when you first visit the page. And collapse all, it collapses all the accordions and expands it on expand all. Similar behavior can be seen with the view holdings page. We have the holdings electronic access a bunch of the accordions added as well. So similar behavior here. 
and the next one is in the checkout app so this deals with the focus management on this app the first time you visit the app um you have the cursor focused in the patron look uh patron barcode uh, box uh, this wasn't there previously so this helps the operator to you know um, avoid the manual focusing of the cursor so on a successful look up it automatically moves the focus to the item barcode scan, uh, box and then you navigate away from the app and then come back again if there is already a successful look up it focuses inside the barcode item barcode one ending the session just clears everything and moves back to the patron look up similarly even in the check in app the first time you visit the app you have the barcode um, being focused here so that you don't have to manually scan um, focus it. and that's all i have for this demo Thanks, Aditya. Um, all right, Matt. Oh no, Matt's not presenting. Uh, Michal is next. Are you there, Michal? Uh, hi, everyone. Yes, I'm here. Let me just adjust. Can you uh, can you see see my screen here? Yes, we can. I was getting the trouble here with this little um, bar on the side, but I'm just move it along. Uh, all right, so uh, my my demo here is also very very quick. Um, the the first thing I would like to show you here is um, the, the tagging and ability to add tags to the users. This is something we presented before, but we have a, a bit more sophisticated version now. So let me just uh, show you, show this to you. Um, you can see I can open the uh, tax pane here by clicking on this show show tax um, button um, and what's different here is we incorporated this um, multi-selection component created by John John Coburn um, which allows us to do a, a, a little more cool stuff so the first thing you can see that is uh, I can see the uh, list of predefined tags in the system which was not possible before. I'm also able to search for them. Um, and also see the, the tags which are already used um, being highlighted here. So you can see the important and ur ur urgent are highlighted. Um, if, that, if that given tag doesn't exist and I want to add new one, I can also just create a new one. Um, and when we create the new one, we, we are adding it to, to this given user, but it also is being added to the uh, global uh, tax repository. So next time I search for it, here it should be, should be already on the list. Um, so this is, this is very, very cool. Th thank you, uh, John Coburn. I, um, I also wanted to thank uh, Anne-Marie because she spent a lot of time testing this. We had a lot of uh, little bugs related to searching and sorting here. Um, and this, this component should be now um, reusable, so it should be pretty easy to um, incorporate it in other modules to add taggings. Uh, so that, that's one one little thing here. Um, and the other other uh, other feature here I wanted to add uh, to present is <coughs> this ability to anonymize um, closed loans. So if we if we move to closed loans tab. Uh, you can see that we, we now have this anonymize all loans button. Um, after I click this, all those closed loans should be should disappear from the from the screen. And hopefully this this happens here. Um, and yep, they they are now gone. If I go back to my previous screen, you can see that the closed loans counter is now zero. And uh, this is part of the GDPR I think requirement which is now in place. Um, and that will be it for me. Thank you. Kate, if I could, about the tags, I just wanted to mention a couple things real quick. Yes, of course. Um, so, yes, Mikhail did a ton of work and the uh, the um, all of the uh, the multi-selection component was, was really helpful. Um, 
the tags component now can be added to any type of records in Folio in any of the apps. So it's only on the user records in the user apps right now, but we have stories to add to the uh, all of the inventory record types and to some of the acquisitions record types. And if there's folks that want to add into other um, into other apps for other record types, let me know and we can talk it through. And the next piece that we are hoping for for tags is to be able to filter in the individual apps by the tags that are assigned to the records. So um, it's, it's great to see this kind of proof of concept with users and know that we can extend it soon to other apps. Thanks, Emory. Yeah, that's really helpful context. Looks really good. Any questions on tags or Mikhail's presentation? Okay, um, then we'll move on to Nil Derek. All right, share my screen. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna take you back to inventory. Uh, we're working on um, um, extending uh, the, the inventory uh, uh, entities with uh, a lot of new uh, properties to sort of make it uh, feature complete with uh, regards to, to properties. And we started out with, uh, uh, with the instance record where we had added some 20 uh, new properties. Uh, at the same time, we have um, uh, uh, reorganized the, the, the layout of the, uh, both the view and the, and the, the form. Uh, I think uh, that you may have seen uh, all the new um, uh, accordions in the, in the view, feature view uh, last time. Uh, I wasn't present there, uh, but, but it's been uh, added, seven new accordions have been added to the, the, the the instance uh, edit form uh, and uh, uh, new elements have been added into uh, many of these accordions and uh, has been uh, some uh, uh, reformatting uh, of, uh, as, as well. Uh, also, as uh, I think it was uh, Jeffrey that mentioned that uh, the fonts and, and titles and stuff has been changed that has affected the, the, the inventory app as well. So. Uh, uh, one of the the accordions that have uh, uh, a lot of new elements added is uh, the administrative uh, data, uh, where we added the uh, uh, human re readable uh, uh, ID. Uh, it's uh, added as an element in the in the backend and is di displayed here. Uh, the, the sort of the uh, functionality of of uh, creating sequence numbers for it is a uh, yet to be done in, in the back end. Uh, we've added uh, uh, instant status term, that's sort of catalog status and uh, a date uh, for for when the, the instant status wa wa was updated and um, mode of issuance, for instance, for this monograph uh, uh, has been added and, uh, and catalog date. Um, then we have the um, as I said, we have the, the sort of uh, redesigned it a bit, uh, made uh, repeatable fields uh, appear in the in the in the usual um, uh, multi column list layout, as as you see in the uh, result list. Um, then we had um, uh, a few new uh, elements added to the descriptive data. Uh, we've added a, a publisher role. Uh, a free text field where you can uh, uh, describe what the, uh, what the role of the publisher is uh, and publication frequency and publication uh, range. Uh, and, and finally, uh, we've added uh, electronic access um, uh, with four, five, six uh, uh, properties um, where you uh, we used to have just a simple URL, but, uh, but that's, that's being replaced with um, uh, with this uh, structure, uh, where you, you still have the URL, but also uh, a link text and uh, and uh, the ability to add some uh, description uh, with regards to what 
role this URL has to uh, in relation to 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 the main uh, uh, instance record uh, and and what link takes to put on it as, as well, and uh, and you can of course then uh, open uh, that um, uh, uh, that document that is being. Uh, um, uh, pointed at, and then and this happens to be a, 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 a content list as as described here, a table of content. Um, and I think that's uh, it for the display page. Then we have a, a few more uh, fields on the um, on the edit page that we don't display, uh, like uh, suppress uh, for staff or on discovery. And, and whether uh, an instant is, uh, is uh, uh, has been previously held, um, and that is uh, the the amount of addition so far. Uh, working progress is uh, actually removing some fields or changing the structure of some fields. Uh, that is uh, more complicated than adding stuff because it has a potential cascading effect into other modules that depend on, on the inventory. Uh, but it's uh, about to um, uh, get merged. So, so we'll have to uh, see how that looks in, 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 a, in a later review maybe. So that's it for me. Thanks, Nels. I know it's been a ton of work. Um, I know Charlotte's spent a lot of time figuring out what it's what needs to be added, and there's plenty more to come. Yeah, we we'll continue with holdings and, and items now. We'll get that in before. before awesome. Next two. Okay. All right, Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the last person on the core team who will be demoing today is Roman, who's actually not on the core team anymore, sadly, but um, this was from work from when he was. So uh, are you ready, Roman? Uh, yeah. Can you see Great. my screen? Yes, I can. Uh. Oh, yeah, I've heard, heard snapshot is not, is acting up. I might just need to refresh. Uh, so I'm going to just demo um, uh, two things. Um, first is, um, well, they're both related to this, this export to CSV function. Um, so here I just exported uh, this table um, so that the user can do what they want to with it uh, locally. Um, and that's for the open loans and closed loans. Um, here's both rows. Um, and then it's also available in the request module. Um, so it's available with this dropdown. Um, sort of the first button that appears here. Uh, I assume that there will be more in the future for other features. Um, and yeah, uh, the, one of the the uh, bugs that the testers caught in testing was that the, um, these fields weren't um, appearing. These proxy. Um, so that that was uh, caught and fixed. So that's it. Roman, do you have a sense of how easy it would be to add export to CSV to other um, lists in Folio? Is this pretty easy to just plug in elsewhere? Yeah, the, um, the MCL, this uh, multi-column list component, mm -hmm. um, it accepts um, just basically a, a, an array of items um, that appear here. You supply that same array to the export CSV function, um, and it will um, uh, export those that that array of, of items. Um, if you have a a list that is very large, like for instance users, um, then it will request all the items um, and export all the items, um, and it doesn't require a, a significant amount of work to to do that. 
uh, you can just follow the example uh, in the requests um, module. Cool. I think this feature is going to, you know, it's going to address a lot of basic kind of in-app reporting needs. Um, I know that with, you know, we need some additional data elements that Tanya has identified for requests to add to the, um, to the export. But once we have those, it'll be kind of a basic in-app report that will allow, um, will support things like pick list or hold shelf expiration. Yeah. So yeah basically, cool. whatever is in the UI, whatever columns are available, um, that, that's what is going to be available in the um, CSV. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Roman. Thanks. All right. Um, that's actually all I had for presenters. I didn't miss anyone, did I? Uh, all right, I think that that might be it. Let me just uh, get back to my presentation to see if there's anything else we should cover. <clears throat> okay, we already went through all of this. Okay, yeah, really, I guess um yeah um i'll uh we'll see each other in, in about a month so we've got two two week sprints coming up um sprint 48 and 40, 49 um and we'll meet again after that you can see in the slide deck um the plans for each of the individual teams what what we'll be working on in the next couple of sprints um so if you want to take a look at that it's right there for you and other than that, I think we're, we're done for today. Is there anything, any questions, comments? All right, great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And I will send out the recording and the deck shortly. Have a great day. Great, thank you. Thanks, Kate. Thanks.